Today we learn how to build a great birthing pod deck in Cube, as well as what a cube needs to support the deck. Welcome to Cultic Cube, where we cube religiously. We make you better at cube and make your cube better. Birthing Pod is a sweet and iconic card that turns any stack of cards into a so-called toolbox deck, a collection of answers for any occasion. Today we'll discuss the attractions and limitations of Birthing Pod decks. Then we'll discuss backup pods and ways of making its underlying strategy more reliable. Finally, we'll be joined by friends and colleagues to examine a few successful pod decks. This video is sponsored by Cuba Majigs, who is coming out with a second series of their incredibly popular and useful Cuba Majig reusable booster packs. Birthing Pod is a beloved card and a really cool build around. If you're like me, it brings back memories of Standard in 2011 when people were using it to assemble Deceiver Exarch Splinter Twin combo, or were just building up to Titans. The card is amazing for allowing fairly robust tutoring from one's deck. It makes me feel clever to understand the menu at my disposal at any given time, and to find the best card for the moment. Pod represents a positive tempo play, provided it remains in play long enough. After the initial investment of mana and a card, it allows one to upgrade one's creatures for a huge discount. Of course, swapping a grizzly bears for a grey ogre at the cost of some mana and possibly some life sounds like a bad deal. But presumably, we are finding not vanilla creatures, but instead those that have value that persists in some form through the exchange. Moreover, we upgrade our creatures at a relatively bargain price that allows us to spend excess mana in other ways, cementing our tempo advantage. Finally, Pod puts a creature into play in a way that largely dodges counter magic, a bit like Aether Vile. There are certain challenges to drafting a Pod deck, as well as pitfalls to avoid. First, Birthing Pod creates unusual deck building demands by requiring that you skew a deck heavily towards creatures, follow a strict curve, and concentrate on creatures that create value on entering or leaving the battlefield. The upshot of all of this is that you will typically be most successful with Birthing Pod when you pick it quite early in the draft and can plan around it. It's often an abysmal pack 3 pick. Moreover, the deck is harder than some to draft well, especially in person, as one has to keep in mind how many creatures at each of the spots in the curve one has drafted. Even if your group permits people to look at their pool between picks, you will very likely annoy the table if, between each pick, you are continually rifling through the pool, trying to remember how many three mana value creatures you've drafted so far. And playing games entails a lot of searching your library for specific cards and then shuffling. Birthing Pod lends itself to dirtly strategies, and hence the deck does not stack up well in environments that support fast, linear strategies, lots of spot removal and sweepers, and high power levels. Don't bring a pod to a mox fight. Nevertheless, in just a bit, friends will explain how they have found success with pod in powered environments. Also, shatter effects are the pod player's nightmare. If one's pod winds up in the yard, or never makes it out of one's library, one's deck could be an incoherent pile of good stuff. Hence good birthing pod decks tend to have backup pods, and the cube designer who puts pod in their environment should look to help drafters by including pod alternatives. A designer might break singleton for birthing pod, including multiples in the draft environment, just as some people do with Delver of Secrets, for instance. Alternatively, a designer might adopt a policy whereby if one drafts birthing pod, one automatically adds a second to one's pool. This is a strategy that some people use with cards such as Squadron Hawk. Setting aside actual duplicates of pod, the pod deck wants as many functionally similar cards as possible. We have gained some options in the past few years. Prime Speaker Vanifar is pod on legs, but she has some serious drawbacks. Creatures are more vulnerable than artifacts. She's a gold card, and summoning sickness prevents her ability from being used at once. Fiend Artisan is a cool card that is in some ways more flexible than pod, though it is often more mana intensive to activate, and is, again, a fragile creature. Other cards that operate in a similar arena as Pod include Natural Order, Green Sun Zenith, Finale of Devastation, Chord of Calling, Ecological Appreciation, Eldritch Evolution, 
Neoform, Vivian, Monster's Advocate, Magus of the Order, Hibernation's End, Vivian's Arcbow, and Pyre of Heroes. There are also options that tutor without putting into play, such as Worldly Tutor, Sylvan Tutor, Eladomri's Call, Altar of Bone, Fauna Shaman, Survival of the Fittest, and Evolutionary Leap. Other useful supporting components in a deck include tutors for finding pod or for starting the chain. Clone effects are great in the deck as they copy mana cost, which can be useful for the pod chain. And the creature-based clones can be tutored up with pod. Mana dorks are good here for being cheap and on color. They are a good place to start a pod chain as they can power out a turn two pod with a little help from your life total. And then they can be turned into something more impactful. Finally, regrowth effects are good for rebuying lost pods, for restarting a chain on a board that's been wrathed, and more generally for capitalizing on the wealth of value creatures that one's deck runs and that one is actively trying to kill off. Creature-based regrowths, such as Eternal Witness, are the most desirable. Both the pod drafter and the designer who wishes to support pod should be on the lookout for strategies whose mechanisms align well with pods. Such strategies will typically be invested in recurring, flickering, or copying value creatures. A few examples of likely pod partners include Recurring Nightmare, Soul Herder, Mimic Vat, and Helm of the Host. Cultic Cube is supported by you. Join our Patreon community, which has all sorts of perks, including additional graphical resources and cube articles delivered straight to your inbox. I also have affiliate relationships with TCG Player, Inked Gaming, and Amazon. Shopping via my affiliate links helps support the show at no additional cost to you. Thanks for your support. Now that we have a birthing pod, and we are keeping an eye out for other useful scaffolding for the deck, let's discuss what the deck looks like. Pod decks should be extremely creature heavy, and creatures need to perform double duty as spells. We want creatures that disenchant that regrow, the doom blade, that shock, and so on. Creatures that leave behind bodies are great, as this allows a portion of their value to endure after they have died, and extra bodies allow one to start new pod chains. We should have creatures at every spot in the curve with no gaps. If we skip four drops entirely, we can't pod from three to five. One mana value creatures tend to be less important in pod decks, as most do not bring a lot of value to the table. A Savannah Lions probably does not belong here, but it can be useful to have a few one drops that Pod can find off of a token, as tokens cost zero. And useful one drops tend to be things such as mana dorks and recursive creatures. Two and three mana creatures are especially important, and I find that in many cubes, three mana value creatures offer a great and diverse amount of value, and hence are good candidates for the Pod deck. Past this point in the curve, the important thing to remember is that you badly want at least two cards in each mana value slot. With just one creature in a given slot, you risk drawing the card and thus creating a gap in the pod chain. Of course, this can still happen with two cards in the slot, but the chance of this happening is reduced. I would caution against using Birthing Pod as an excuse to be too liberal with one's curve or one's mana base you are extremely unlikely to pod up to 10 drops. I would hesitate to run even 7 drops in the deck without some other support for getting them on the field via ramp or cheat. And I would not use pod to rationalize running a 5 color special. If your deck is full of uncastable creatures, then it just doesn't function without the pod, which is a frustrating place to be. I have been focusing mainly on pod decks that may be rather incoherent mid-range menageries of value. But it is also possible to build pod decks that enable, or support, more focused plans, typically involving creature combo. Thus, as in days of Zendikar and Scar's standard, Birthing Pod can help turn on twin combo by tutoring for Kikijiki, Deceiver Exarch, and friends. Pod can find Spike Feeder and Archangel of Thune. Persist combo works great with Pod, as the Pod both finds combo pieces and serves as a sacrifice outlet. And even if one cannot go infinite, creatures with Persist or Undying are good pod creatures. Let's take a quick look at some successful pod decks that are by different designers and that hail from different environments. 
First, I will chat about two decks that were drafted in Petty Nobility, which is my master's level 450 card cube. Then I'll introduce decks by three friends and colleagues. The first deck is a Jund pod deck. It has some aristocrats elements, which fit neatly with pods, self-sacrifice, and ETB plan. The deck is adept at rebuying creatures from the yard. It has many ways of copying creatures for additional value and more pod fodder, such as Bramble Sovereign, Nightmare Shepherd, and the nearly uncastable, but eminently potable, Hoffrey Ghost Forge, Fiend Artisan as a second pod. A second deck from Petty Nobility is effectively an Azorius Blink deck, with familiar enablers such as Brago, Soul Herder, and Conjurer's Closet. It's a short leap from flicker deck to pod deck, as both decks want to squeeze all the value they can from ETB creatures. This pod provides some redundancy for the blink operational access, and it helps to find whatever pieces are missing to turn on the blink nonsense. The fact that pod and its ability can be paid for with life means that the deck can easily make do with three green mana sources. Steve, whom you may know as Steve David Music on Twitter, supplied us with a deck and a thoughtful write-up. He calls the deck Selesnia Survival Pod, and he drafted it in late 2018. He points out the novelty of how hard he leans into token production in the deck, and the use of Mirror Entity to turn a fragile team into a horde of monsters. Steve maintains that 3, 4, and 5 mana are the meat and potatoes of a pod chain. Good cube ETBs tend to begin at 3 mana value, and at 5 MV the ETBs are extremely powerful. Steve notes that the 4-drop slot has become much better for pod decks over the past few years, as we have gained Questing Beast, Wicked Wolf, and Nightpack Ambusher. Next we have Charlie, aka Magic the Simpsonine on Twitter. Charlie is a great follow for his cube insight, for images of his delightful Simpsons-themed proxies, and of course, for his excellent Simpsons memes. Hattily ho, neighborinos, Magic the Simpsoning here. To briefly chat about a subtype of the birthing pod archetype, behold, Rug Kiki Pod. This variation of the pod deck seeks to end the game abruptly, decisively, and in a way that's often difficult to disrupt. In this particular iteration, Pod is a tool to roll disruptive value creatures into game-ending 5 drops. Plan A with this deck is always to marry the Hasty Hellions, Kiki-Jiki, and Zealous Conscripts. Joining Pod in this victorious venture are cohorts and creature-based combos like Survival of the Fittest, Fauna Shaman, as well as some diggers and drawers like Smuggler's Copter, Factor Fiction, and Mole Drifter. However, the beauty of this Pod deck that while it packs the potential of Fast and Furious Victory, it can also go very long by leaning on traditional pod toolbox strategies. The deck is also chock full of powerful synergies. Kiki Jiki, less devastatingly but more funly, combos with Rex Stage, Eternal Witness, Avalanche Riders, P and Kira, Mole Drifter, Inferno Titan, and Dragonlord Atarka. Phantasmal Image rocks as well with all this ETB stuff. Drafting Kiki Pod is an adventure, and not always a smart one. Having to meticulously fill a curve of 3 to 6 mana creatures can sometimes go awry. If you first pick that Kiki, you could very well be engaging in a little self-sabotage by going for Pod instead of sticking to a tight blue-red combo shell. However, if you want to grow crazy Broadway style, always be on the lookout for cards that will facilitate and augment your combos. Draw and filtering is important since this deck can falter without its engines. I also enjoy doubling down on big synergies. This style of deck is naturally friendly with other goofy combo decks like Sneak Attack, Recurring Nightmare, Living Death, and Blink. I fully endorse going full Dr. Frankenstein and crossbreeding this with whatever other niche strategies is being neglected by the boring trophy hunters around you. I made a quick pros and cons list. So the first pro, this deck is super fun to play. There are decisions to make, big splashy moments of triumph, and wacky interactions that will create lasting memories. And isn't that what hobbies like Magic the Gathering are all about, making memories together? Con uh, is the mana. You're almost certainly starting off base red-green with intensive requirements in both colors. You also usually need black and or blue uh, just to get that density of enter the battlefield creatures like Moldrifter, or if you're in black, something like Ravenous Chupacabra, which stretches your colors even more. And sometimes 
Sometimes you even need white for Restoration Angel. This means in addition to your already lengthy list of priority picks, you need lands real bad as well. Another con, you can just kind of draw a crappy pile of cards with this deck. You'll just be drawing Avalanche Rider, Farmer Shaman, Eternal Witness without really getting, well, without getting the pod is the big one. You don't draw pod or Kiki Jiki, this particular deck can really struggle. And it's just not gonna be as good as what your opponent's doing with their blue cards. And so that feels bad. You'll feel stupid for having drafted this deck when that happens. But final pro, this deck makes you feel better at 2-1 than White Weenie does at 3-0. And that's just kind of how I feel about it. You know, once the rug ties the room together, if you will, it's just a really good feeling. Bye diddly eye. Finally, I introduce Elliot, AKA Sniffy Goal on Twitter. Sniffy is active in many corners of the large cube community, and you will recognize him from this very channel. The first of the Roundtable Cube draft videos I made showed many players' perspectives on a draft of Elliot's Monkey Cube. What a fun time and a great cube. Hi, Elliot here. Uh, also known as Sniffy Goal on Twitter. We're just going to talk about Pod for a minute. I've got a few points to make. Uh, let's look at this deck here. Number one, ETBs. You're going to see here I got a lot. You got to make sure when you're drafting, you're taking them really. You got to make sure when you're designing the cube, curating the cube, add a few extras. This is how the pod deck gets card advantage, right? It's not going to have a lot of room for spells. You're at 18, 19, 20 creatures. You want to make sure you add a variety of ETB creatures along the curve so that they can accrue value and keep moving up the chain and not fall behind. Otherwise, they're going to be running a card disadvantage and the deck is always going to lose. Beyond that, look at the creatures. I've got two card co creature combos all over the curve here. I've got Helia Ballista, Kiki Resto, Kiki Pestermite. These are all great ways to close out the game. You can also do a persist combo, a little more tougher and all of that. These are all great tools for the deck. Have a couple of these in the cube. They're great for other decks. They're great for this deck. And then beyond that, my final point, your curve. Decide the colors you want the deck to be in. Glut the curve a bit. Three, fours, fives. Have a few extras. The draft is going to change considerably. The deck is going to be much better. All right, that's it. I'm out of here. Cardamajigs is sponsoring this video, and I am really excited about their new products, for which they are launching a Kickstarter on July 13, 2021. If you are a cube designer, you likely already know how invaluable Cubamajigs reusable draft packs are. These were a game changer for my group and for my own organizational sanity. Series 2 is an upgrade to the originals. New draft packs will come pre-built and have been re-engineered to prevent bulging. Moreover, Cardamajigs has commissioned more than 30 original artworks by established MTG artists, which will grace the new packs and which will be emblazoned on the awesome new cube boxes, each of which fits up to 54 Cubamajig packs. Get in on the ground floor with Cubamajigs Series 2 and contribute to the Kickstarter by visiting cubeks.com. Allow me to distill this video into one piece of advice. Add more pods. If you are a cube designer, consider breaking Singleton to add another actual pod. If you are building a pod deck, secure some of those backup pods that we discussed. Thanks so much to our contributors for their insights. Let's keep hanging out and chatting cube.